Hello everyone, it's Lindsay, and today I'm back with another Word Study Wednesday for you guys. We are continuing on with this series um, based off of the Living Stones devotional release from Open Journey. I will put an unboxing down below if you want to see everything that comes in that release. There's physical product, digital product, a new set of Word focus cards. And so those are the cards that I have been using as I work through this particular series of Word Study Wednesdays. Uh, just heads up, there may or may not be one next week. Um, that'll be the first week of September. I will be out of town for a retreat. I'm trying to pre-film, but I don't want to rush it. I don't want to rush the study. I don't want to just put up content just to put up content. So if I have time to get all that done, there will be a video. Um, but if there isn't, I'm not missing. <laughs> I'm out enjoying fellowship with some of you in person, which I'm super excited about. So I will have a art process for uh, today's study. So I'll put a timestamp down below if you're just wanting to fast forward to see what the art process is. But I've been really enjoying kind of taking you guys through some of the study notes and study process that I have done. And like I said, I'm using the newest set of cards that go along with the Living Stones study. And rather than just going through the cards in alphabetical order, I've been trying to pick cards that go along with that particular week's uh, devotional content that I looked at. And so there was a process video that I did this week week uh, for the third section, I believe, of the Living Stones devotional. I'll put a little card here or a link down below to that uh, process video. And so I've been trying to coordinate the two. So I'm trying to pick a word that kind of piggybacks off of that study that I did uh, just to kind of go a little deeper and pull things together. And so it's not so scattered and all over the place for you guys. So for today, um, we're looking at the word uh, altar. And for this week's study, we looked at a couple of different incidences of altars or memorials that were built. We saw in Exodus, uh, Moses was commanded by God to build an altar uh, that was made out of rough stones, so not hand cut stones. And we kind of go into detail about the importance of that and why that was done. Um, then we also looked at a passage in Joshua chapter four, um, where Joshua had just led the Israelites uh, across the Jordan River. The Jordan had been parted by God for them so they could safely cross the river. And uh, because of that, and due to God's faithfulness, they were commanded to, uh, or they were instructed to uh, put, put up rock memorials, uh, altars, uh, as a place of worship and remembrance of God's faithfulness to them in that time. And so uh, as I was looking through the cards, I figured altar was the perfect one to go uh, take a look at. And so I have gone ahead and just typed out... Um, one of the verses, there are a ton of verses that Ingrid has here for us. She also has the Greek word and the Hebrew word, depending on if you're a New Testament or Old Testament. Uh, and then one of the study notes that I pulled, uh, and that will be on the back of the card. And like I said, the art process will be down below for you guys, and we'll put that together. But uh, the notes were pretty straightforward this week. There is not really any kind of behind the scenes hidden meaning to the word altar as far as the language goes. So I did look at it in the Greek as well as in the uh, Hebrew and it's pretty straightforward. Basically, it's just, um, you know, a place usually um, elevated, but not always that that's um, you kind of see both. Uh, and we kind of go into detail in the Exodus account of if you go to the next verse, I can't remember go back and watch my video from this week, but basically that, you know, they didn't want it to be stairs leading up to the altar because as the priests were walking up the stairs, their ankles might be shown. And so they didn't want their flesh to be exposed as they're going to worship. And so uh, definitely something to think about there that also the importance of not carving the stones into intricate, beautiful works of art. Um, it really shouldn't be about us. It shouldn't be our our flesh, our fleshly desires, what we enjoy, what we like, what we think is pretty, what, you know, all these things when it comes to our worship, it's not about us. It's about God and honoring God. Um, somebody left a wonderful comment on my video this week, uh, you know, thinking about our worship practices today in our churches. And uh, we have gone the whole gamut. We've been at a church that has a full worship team production, the whole thing. Um, and now we're at a church where it's just hymns and maybe a guitar or piano, but very, very simple. And we actually love that even more because it's not about the worship team. It's not about the, you know, what's on the screen and the lights and uh, heaven forbid you have like 
smoke machines for your worship uh, that I just think is a little bit much. It's not about making it an experience where we have feelings. It's about us worshiping God and that it should be stripped back to just that. Uh, and so you can kind of study, in, you know, in that direction there. But uh, looking at altars as another place of worship and another form of worship. And so basically just a place where burnt offerings can be offered up to uh, God. We also see, uh, I saw some commentary equating some of the altars we have in our churches today, such as the pulpit being a place of worship. So a modern day form of an altar. Uh, and so various different ways that this can, can look. Uh, for the Hebrew word, it was very straightforward. Strong's definition was just an altar. There is nothing fancy, no hidden meaning, no alternative meaning, nothing. It's just an altar. Um, and so, you know, sometimes God just keeps things very, very, very simple for us. So before I get into the scripture, I am going to go through all of the scripture that Ingrid has for us. Uh, rather than pulling a whole lot of commentary, I just decided to kind of pull a, uh, concise look at what an altar is. So I use, uh, gotquestions.org. Um, that is a fantastic resource. If you have questions. Uh, and they're pretty good about, you know, they have a conservative kind of reformed leaning uh, stance on a lot of things, but they do also offer an insight or a look at some of the alternative viewpoints on some things and gives you resources. There's lots of articles about different things on there. Uh, just a really, really great uh, resource to use. So there was an article titled, What is an Altar? Uh, and so I went ahead and pulled that just to kind of give you some examples of different ways that altars appeared and their meaning. So it says an altar is any structure upon which offerings such as sacrifices are made for religious purposes. It was usually a raised platform with a flat surface. There are over 400 references to altars in the Bible. The word altar is first used in Genesis 8:20 when Noah built an altar to the Lord after leaving the ark. However, the idea was present as early as Genesis 4, 3 through 4, when Cain, Cain and Abel brought their sacrifices to the Lord. They most likely presented their offerings on some type of altar, even though the word altar is not used in that passage. An altar always represented a place of consecration. Before God gave his law to Moses, men made altars wherever they were out of, where when made altars wherever they were out of whatever material was available. An altar was often built to commemorate an encounter with God that had a profound impact upon someone. We see this in Abraham with Abraham in Genesis 12, 7, Isaac in Genesis 26, 24 through 25, Jacob in Genesis 35, 3, David in 1 Chronicles 21, 26, and Gideon in Judges 6, 24, all built altars and worshiped after having a unique encounter with God. An altar usually represented a person's desire to consecrate himself fully to the Lord. God had worked in a person's life in such a way that the person desired to create something tangible to memorialize to memorialize it. Uh, and this really goes along with the living stones and the, and the section that Ingrid pulled together for us of using these stones as physical, tangible ways to memorialize you know, how God has been faithful in our lives. Um, throughout that devotional, she also gives some exercises for creating, you know, a, a prayer jar of stones and in each one of those stones representing, um, you know, a prayer, a prayer, prayer answered, an incident of God's faithfulness. And so I love just kind of tying that in um, physically, tangibly with this devotional content. It goes on to say that sometimes God himself commanded that an altar be built after he had delivered someone in a miraculous way. We see this in Deuteronomy 27, 4 through 7, Exodus 31. Uh, such an altar would be a memorial to help future generations remember the mighty works of the Lord. Because atonement is God's work, the law specified that an altar made of stones must be made with natural uncut stones, for you will defile it if you use a tool on it, Exodus 20, 25. That is the passage that we looked at uh, in this week's devotional content, um, Exodus 20, 26 and 27, I believe is where it's talking about not having stairs, uh, up to the, uh, altar and this, uh, you know, as a memorial to future generations, this is playing into that passage in Joshua chapter four. It was not just for those specific Israelites who were crossing the river to memorialize his faithfulness, but it was for those who passed by later generations to be reminded of God's faithfulness. And in fact, we looked all the way forward in the New Testament and saw um, where John the Baptist may even have been referring back to these memorials um, and remembering God's faithfulness in the Old Testament. 
goes on to say, in the broadest sense, an altar is merely a designated place where a person consecrates himself to someone or something. Many church buildings have altars for prayer, communion, weddings, and other sacred purposes. Some Christians create their own altars for personal worship as visible, visible reminders of Romans 12, 1, which says to present yourself as a living sacrifice. Uh, always just being careful and mindful of um, not creating an idol out of um, that altar that we are worshiping God, not the physical place or items on that altar. I think that's a very important thing to remember. Um, going back to the importance of it being, you know, raw, uncut uh, stones that it's built out of that, you know, it's not, it's not about how pretty it is. It's not about the, the artist behind it, um, that it is about worship. Every human heart has an invisible altar where the war between the flesh and the spirit rages. When we surrender areas of our lives to the control of the Holy Spirit, we are in effect laying that area on the altar before God. It can help to visualize Abraham's altar where he offered his son Isaac to the Lord in Genesis 22, 9. We can ask the Lord what areas of our lives he is requiring that we offer to him. We can symbolically lay that on the altar and let go. We don't need a flat top surface. We can surrender our lives to God on the altar of our hearts at any time really love how that kind of ends that we don't need that physical place any longer. Um, you know, Christ is our mediator. Now we have the Holy spirit living within us and we can have that, um, communication with God through that. Um, we can surrender our lives to God on the altar of our hearts at any time. So our sacrifice now is not clean animals and certain things like that. Our sacrifice is ourselves. We, we die to ourselves, right? We pick up our cross, carry it daily. Um, we are slaves to Christ. We sacrifice our desires, our wants, our flesh to live for Christ. And so that is kind of how we see altars in modern day. So going into the passages, uh, Ingrid has quite a few for us. I think I'm actually going to go backwards and start with the Old Testament. And we'll work forward to the New Testament just so you can kind of see um, the transition um, between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Genesis 8, 20. Um, this is actually the passage that I typed out on the back of my card. Uh, then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. John MacArthur says um, about this passage here that this was done as an act of worship in response to God's covenant faithfulness in sparing him and his family. It's an act of worship. Uh, Genesis 12, 7, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to your descendants, I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. Uh, John MacArthur says that this was the first true place of worship ever erected in the promised land. We see here in Genesis 12. Genesis 22, 9, then they came to the place of which God had told him and Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood and bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Here's where we see, you know, God calls Abraham to sacrifice Isaac to him. And at the last second, uh, God provides a uh, clean ram, lamb to be sacrificed in place of Isaac. So um, he is then, uh, you know, just giving thanks to God after this for his faithfulness, the way that he provides. Genesis 26, 25. So he built an altar there and called upon the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there. And there Isaac's servants dug a well. Exodus 40, 29. He set the altar burnt offering before the doorway of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting and offered on it the burnt offering and the meal offering, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. Exodus 20, 25. If you make an altar of stone for me, you should not build it out of cut stones for you wield your tool on it. You will profane it. That again is that scripture we looked at this week. Isaiah 6, 6. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. I believe we're going to look at this passage maybe next week or the week after in the devotional content. Psalm 84, 3. The bird also has found a house and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young. Even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Uh, let's see. So then going into Old Testament, we have, or I'm sorry, New Testament, uh, we have Revelation 8, 3. Another angel came and stood at the altar holding a golden censer and much incense was given to him so that he might add it to the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar, which was before the throne. Uh, some of the commentary I read about this one is saying that this altar in this revelation that John has in Revelation, uh, the altar is holding the prayers that have been offered up to God. Uh, so just a very interesting visual there. Matthew 5, 24, leave your offering there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and present your offering. 
Revelation 6, 9, when the lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who have been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. Um, this is referencing uh, the martyrs for the Christian faith. Uh, 1 Corinthians 9, 13, do you not know that those who perform sacred services eat the food of the temple and those who attend regularly to the altar have their share from the altar? And uh, talking about the share for the priests, those who were working um, were provided for by the um, temple. Matthew 23, 19, you blind men, which is more important, the offering or the altar that sanctifies the offering? Really interesting um, one to look at there. So there is just a quick look at some of the study notes that I uh, pulled. Great resource. You could go through and read all the scriptures that are included in here as well. I'll try to link the um, article down below if you guys want to take a closer look at that and kind of peruse through gotquestions.org. Um, but there is a look at the study. And so I have a fairly simple card to go along with a fairly simple study today. Like I guess I already went ahead and typed some things on a separate card. Um, you could also print those off if you wanted to do that. Uh, I had some hymnal paper that I had uh, colored. You may have seen my reels video this week where I've been dyeing papers with distress reinkers. Uh, so this was a hymnal that had been donated to our church and then given to me. And as you can see, I haven't been using it because it's, it's white pages and I wanted like that antique grungy look uh, of a antique hymnal. And so I, it had just been sitting on my shelf. So I went ahead and uh, with that technique of dyeing paper with distress root inkers, I dyed this one with some tea dye. Uh, and so it aged it up, made it look all, you know, grungy and antique, which is exactly what I wanted. Love that. Uh, and it's acid free because the distress reinker is acid free. So not that that's as much of a concern on these cards because they're not going directly in my Bible. Um, but if you're including things in your Bible, tea dye, coffee dye, just kind of make me a little nervous to do that. And so I like that this process is a little bit safer. So um, this is actually going to be the background for my card. I pulled out this hymn, Holy, 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 uh, Lord God Almighty. I just, I think, you know, when we're talking about altars and talking about worship, you know, and reminding ourselves that it is, it is towards God. It's not about us. It's because God is a holy God who deserves to be worshiped. And so, you know, I thought that this was a good him to pull. So that's going to be my background. Uh, I'm going to do a technique. I think I've shown here on my channel a couple times, but using a uh, texture crackle paste and distress glazes to create kind of a mosaic broken tile look. I just really love that. I wanted this to be really just kind of simple and soft and pull some of the things that I enjoy doing. Uh, I do have the newest stamp sets from Open Journey as well. I'm going to use these crosses. Of course, I've been loving those quite a bit. Uh, and that's really going to be pretty simple. So let me go ahead and put you guys on fast forward and put together this card for the word altar. All right. So I cut my background pieces down to about four inches by four inches. Uh, it's actually th should be three and three quarters, but I leave my self a little room on the length that way I can create a torn edge. So it ends up being about three and three quarter inches tall by four inches wide is kind of the standard that I use for these cards. Now to glue this down to the background, I am going to use some matte gel medium rather than a regular liquid glue. I don't want the liquid glue to show through the hymnal paper because it is a little on the thinner side. And before I glue that down, I remembered I wanted to ink up the bottom edge of this page and I almost make a giant mistake right here. Uh, so I'm making sure my glue is on there good. I inked it up, go to lay it down. Wait, I inked the wrong side. So I'll go back, ink the correct side of that hymnal paper and then adhere it down uh, with that matte gel medium. And then I just take a brayer tool and run that over the top of it just to make sure it's good and adhered uh, all the way down. Now you could add a layer over the top of this to really seal it in. But at this point, there wasn't really anything I was doing that I needed to seal the top of it for. But if you're wanting, you know, a slick surface, you could use gesso uh, and then that would give you a sealed in surface. I'm taking that tea dye distress ink and just inking up the uh, rest of the edges of that top portion of the card. And then here comes kind of the main technique that I'll be doing. So I have this floral stencil. This is like my favorite stencil from Tim Holtz. Any opportunity I can to use this, I do. And I'm trying to figure out what orientation. I don't want it to cover up a whole bunch of the title of that hymn, but 
it, it ends up doing that, but that's, that's okay. It's just the background. I'm just holding that down with some mint tape. And then I pulled out my opaque white crackle paste. Now mine, I need to get a new tub of. It's a little dry. It's a little weird when I go into it and it kind of gives me some fits and troubles as I'm working with it. But at this point, I'm just working with what I got. So I'm using a palette knife to put that through the stencil. Um, also contending with the fact that it's dry and warm in my house. And so this stuff, as it dries, like pulls apart, the surface of it dries. And so to use this technique, you have to work pretty quickly and I kind of fight with it because it's so dry in my house. But while the texture paste is still wet, I'm gonna go in with some Distress Glazes. I have peeled paint, speckled egg, and antique linen. And I'm just taking a little mini spoon and dropping the Distress Glaze over different areas of that texture paste. Now remember this texture paste is wet. It's just freshly applied. And that's going to allow the Distress Glaze to stick to it. Uh, however, I have some sticking issues just because it's so dry in my house. So there's already almost like a film that has formed over the top of this Distress uh, or over the crackle paste. And so it's not adhering as well. I think it's also because it's an older tub of uh, crackle paste. It's a little on the drier side anyways. I'm kind of fighting with it. So I do go in with my finger and kind of gently press the powder into the paste. And then you're going to kind of tap around and this is going to remove all the excess powder. Now this powder on the paper is just throwaway. It's like muddy mix mess. So you don't want to go in too heavy handed with your powder when you're applying it. And you can see in that top right hand corner of that flower, the powder didn't adhere. And that's because the paste had already dried too much for the powder to adhere. So uh, you do have to work fairly quickly and maybe not hoard your crackle paste until it's a dried gross mess in the pot. <laughs> so I set that aside and let it air dry. And as it dries, the paste crackles and pulls apart. But one thing I found was that it was also pulling away from the paper. Again, I think because it was just too dry in the pot, you can see a big chunk just flopped off. But uh, in the end, it, it works out okay. I want this to be distressed anyways. So now that the paste is dry, I can go ahead and melt the embossing glaze. So I'm using my embossing tool to melt that glaze and it, give it gives it this like crackled, uh, broken tile kind of look. I don't know. I just really love the look of that technique. If I had gessoed the top of the hymnal paper, I could go in with a distressed crayon to really highlight um, and get, you know, be, get down into all the nooks and crannies of that crackle paste. But I didn't, I wasn't thinking of it at the time. So moving on to the crosses, I am going to emboss these as well. I use my EK Success powder tool to prep the page, which I should have done all along. Anytime you're embossing, you need to prep the page with an embossing tool. Um, that is gonna apply some powder down to the paper that's gonna remove any moisture. So if my ink had been still wet, if I had any fingerprints on the paper, that way the embossing powder only sticks to the stamped ink or to the embossing, I'm sorry, the texture paste or whatever it is that I want the embossing powder to stick to. Um, but I kept forgetting. I was just trying to get this done before it was too hot. I have been waking up at four in the morning to try to work to get done before it's too hot in my house. So I'm running on no sleep. <laughs> but I did stamp those crosses with some VersaFine Onyx Black ink. And then I'm adding some gold embossing powder. It doesn't matter what ink you use as long as it stays wet because this is an opaque embossing powder. So you can see it doesn't it doesn't make any difference. But for the sake of the camera, you can see where I was stamping if I use black ink versus clear ink. So this point I'm feeling like it's just a little plain and I want to bring attention to those flowers. So I try adding some splatters of speckled egg and peeled paint distress oxide ink. That actually kind of made things worse. Uh, probably shouldn't have done that step. So then I think maybe some white acrylic paint splatters maybe would add a little more contrast. It's just feeling a little flat at this point. So I add this in there. It does help. The issue is that that floral image is kind of competing with the background. So here is a look at what it's like right now, which isn't horrible, but I bring out some tea dye distress ink and a water brush. And I'm going to use this to kind of create a halo effect around that floral image. So I'm just kind of dropping it 
down over the crackled area. So it's falling all into the little cracks. You can see it's really amplifying the cracks. Now you can see them. This is what I meant about using a distressed crayon. So if you had sealed the hymnal paper with a layer of gesso or matte gel medium over the top of it, then at this stage, rather than using the ink, you could go in with a distressed crayon and kind of rub it and, you know, put it down into this image and it would blend over the top of the prepped background. But since I didn't do that, I decided to go in with the ink and that does help. It adds a little bit of a halo around that floral image to help it stand out from the background a little bit. Went ahead and stamped the strong screen coordinates number using some speckled egg distress oxide ink. And on the back of here is why I do two separate cards. You can see some of my ink got onto the back of the card, but that's okay because I have a second card with all of my information on it. And that also kind of reinforces the card so it's a little bit sturdier as well if you're going to be going crazy with a lot of mixed media on the front of it. I just use my corner chomper to round the corners. And that is gonna be it for the card today. Fairly simple, just trying out some different things I haven't done in a while. If you have any questions or comments, be sure to leave those down below. Give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Check out the description box for links to everything that I used. Subscribe to my channel if you're not already subscribed. And until next time, thank you so much. Bye-bye.